Hello, I'm David Halpin. Uh, I'm a doctor first and surgeon second. I qualified at St Mary's Hospital in 1964. After 11 years of training, I became a consultant in trauma and orthopedic surgery. Uh, I semi-retired about 2003, 2005, and I've continued my deep interest in all local, national, and global matters, and believe in following my father's advice to stand up and speak out whenever necessary. What's been exercising you recently is the... It, well, it's actually an inquest around a particular care home. Can you tell us why you picked up the paper and started um, trying to find out more about it? Yes. I took an interest in the deaths that occurred in the Holmesley Care Home in Sidford, near Sidmouth, uh, in the early part of 2021. That was very soon after the inverted commas rollout of a untested so-called vaccine against the coronavirus, uh, which was then causing illness, particularly in the very vulnerable, and death in some. Why do you take a particular interest? Well, because this is a coroner's inquest going on. Were you asked to give evidence? Did you want to give evidence? Were you able to give evidence? No, because it was a cluster, that was important to me as a doctor with a good knowledge of epidemiology and because there had been previous reports of a cluster of deaths in a care home in Anglesey, I forget its name, and certainly in Cannington. And interestingly, Spotlight BBC, based in Plymouth, had given a very good report on the first um, re on, uh, regarding the Cannington cluster. Uh, very good report in, in terms of fact, but the next day, it seemed that everything was quiet. So uh, we had the Anglesey care home deaths, Cannington, and then next thing is one heard about these deaths. And Can we just explain the context for anyone that's not familiar? These care homes, when there was a COVID outbreak in a care home, this was quite serious. You've got a lot of elderly people. Uh, many of them were being transferred to hospital without even being tested. Well, the testing is another matter. Uh, the um, RT-PCR test was later dismissed by WHO, I think, in the summer of 2021 as being of no use. Well, look, hang on, because uh, what's, surely the best thing to do, rather than transfer people who are ill with COVID into a hospital, is to isolate them within the care home. I mean, yes. what's, the, what's your diagnosis? What's the best thing to do? Um, if I was running a care home with very frail elderly who could be knocked down with a feather, say with influenza, then I would, uh, if I had the staff in sufficient numbers and skill, I would keep them in the care home. But I know what would happen. Uh, the managers of the care home with CQC behind them, fearing CQC, criticising them, would probably want to offload the responsibility and ship them to hospital. That's what was happening, I bet. Well, in some care homes, they decided to keep their elderly people and actually not allow the staff to leave the site either. No. Well, that you can imagine that hard work staff, often insufficient staff, uh, working often in inadequate environments, small stuffy rooms, um, difficulty in keeping everything clean, uh, changing bed linen when people are incontinent, but the burdens on care staff are great. And uh, it, it's quite obvious to me that given the state of fear generated by num number 10 in particular, that there would be all sorts of chaotic responses in the res people responsible in those care homes. So whether they should keep them at ho in the home or have them sent to hospital, uh, I can imagine that there was all sorts of different opinions and they were under the most tremendous pressure uh, from the fear, from looking after very frail people in often inadequate circumstances with inadequate staff. 
Well, look, the uh, World Health Organization quite early on came out with a treatment protocol. The hospitals kept rigidly to that, um, citing insurance reasons, saying, well, look, if we step outside this, we're no longer insured if people take us to court, if they die here or they get seriously ill here. So the insurance companies were really dictating the treatment protocol once people arrived in hospitals. Insurance companies? Well, I wasn't so sure about that, but I know that was a reason for certain closures of certain things, like our flower show in the summer of 21, local flower show. Well, that's that's what, what I'm saying is the hospitals were saying that they were not insured to treat anybody in a different way than the World Health Organization had prescribed. Is, do you mean DGH's, NHS hospitals? They're not insured? No. There's no insurance. I don't, I don't think so. But let's Maybe not, it's an American thing. That, that would be American. That would be certainly American, but not here. I don't think, anyway. But as you know, in fact, John O'Looney, Undertaker, has produced some very, very important uh, records of the whole thing. But one thing that was happening was that people who had been who'd come into hospital were believed on clinical grounds, leaving testing aside, to have had COVID, were often sent back to the care homes with COVID, so that infection was occurring. If the people in the care home had not suffered illness, they might have suffered it subsequently with discharge. Now, later on, I know that hospitals were having a roundabout system. They were, first of all, discharged to some, they were sent down to the outpatients, in fact, um, uh, often at very short notice, causing more distress. They were then sent to a separate location. And I think after some sort of triage, in you know, was there, they might have gone back to the care home. The whole thing was chaotic. And if you look at my uh, website, which is dhalpin, D-H-A-L-P-I-N, dot infoaction, i n f o a c t i o n dot org dot u k and you put in the word dyer d y e r in the search engine there are two um, postings about dr dyer he was the medical director then of torbay hospital the um, postings refer to six patients treated in torbay and two at the r d n e one of them at the RDNE was our. Where is this RDNE? Where is that? Royal Devon, Royal Devon Exeter. It's the big DGH um, in the, on the outskirts of Exeter. And. District General Hospital. General Hospital. A district General Hospital. Like Torbay, that's also a DGH, District General Hospital. The one of the two cases at the RDNE was our daughter, our eldest granddaughter, Isabel. A very important fact. Uh, 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 attaches to her, which is not yet added as a footnote to that second posting. But this is the point. In that list of six patients who were treated poorly at Torbay, the first in the most atrocious, atrocious way that I could ever describe, was a man called Dr. Brown East. He was our GP. He was then aged about 90. Read how he was treated. That was during covid well tell us well i'll tell you um he was in a care home in a titchy little room at high week above newton abbott uh, he complained of difficulty breathing now i don't know what the cause of that was but he was uh, finding so quite a few things difficult um he was sent to a and e on a monday at torbay accident emergency I think in the early afternoon, a lady consultant there, I think on the A&E staff, decided to put a scope down his gullet, but his complaint was of his breathing. So the logic of that was not very obvious. So that was done. I, this is done with um, gel, uh, perhaps with local anaesthetic, I don't know about that, maybe with some sedation. He was elderly and not very fit. I don't know what she found. I don't know about that. I didn't see the notes. But he was sent back to the care home, care home, not nursing home, 
At 11 o'clock at night that same day, he died two days later uh, in respiratory distress, I believe. So that elderly, wonderful doctor, also a St. Mary's graduate, interestingly, was treated in a most irrational and, I think, very poor way by the hospital during the COVID chaos. So let's get back to these care home deaths. Um, the uh, inquest which really should have been a public inquiry. If you've got a cluster of deaths in a certain area, all unexplained, then they need to be looked at together. That's not really the job of an inquest. That's the job of a public inquiry. No, I think the inquest has happened. I now see the context because seven relatives of seven of the, uh, I think, 11, who, uh, the 10 who died in this cluster complained about the care in the care home. Okay, so just w- the, remind us, where, the, where went, is the care home? What's it called? It, it's called, uh, the, it was called, it's changed its name now, it's changed its ownership, it was, as they do, it was called the um, Holmesley Care Home Sidford. Rather nice-looking building in nice grounds, but from what evidence has been reported in the papers, uh, the staff were under pressure. There weren't sufficient staff. But a male nurse in the headline that I've just quoted, has been obviously scapegoated. So he's not feeling too happy, I don't imagine. He was a registered nurse. There weren't many on the on the staff, I believe. I don't know about that. But quite often care home staff are often not registered nurses. They're not nursing homes. So going back to this, uh, relatives of seven complained, some to the police, and there was a police inquiry, and they arrested two care carers at the care home, the police. They were then bailed, and then no prosecution followed. And there's been some reported uh, anger in the relatives that the CPS have decided not to pursue the complaints. Okay, so what's, what are the relatives saying? Relatives saying that um, the regulations, uh, the so-called instructions, the rules, the mandates or whatever, coming out of number 10 via those desks with the hatching around them from Professor Whitty et al., uh, were not being followed properly, the people weren't being tested appropriately, and that the care, some of them, in fact, criticised the care that their relatives were having. So how's the, uh, what's happened with the inquest then? Could, well, the inquest was, I, this was all back in, there was this flurry, uh, back in the early part of about February 2021, uh, when the um, the experimental vaccines, unnecessary, were being rolled out, and all that chaos of relatives not being allowed to see their loved ones in care homes, they were going like I know in dear one the lady I know she was she was being kissed through the window by her relatives in a care home in Ippelpen. That was going all around the country. Uh, there were people wearing double masks. I, I've written all about this. You know, the whole thing was a nonsense. As worn by them, they were grossly contaminated and no use whatsoever for filtering virions of, the, of any sort. They were being allowed to shop, as you may remember, by the administration in our country, even though in the if anyone was infected with this virus or other viruses in that environment with air conditioning circulating everything and not filtering it, they would have been infected in supermarkets that they were allowed to shop in. The well, whole what, thing what, was well, one absolutely of the, irrational. Well, one of the most amazing things, if you think about it, was that you've got COVID freely circulating yes. in the outside world and you've got care workers coming in and out and in and out yes. of these care homes all the time. Yes, and that happened with flu, happens with coryza, the common cold, and this virus, which was not associated with any unusual risk of mortality, was a fact of life. So what is it about this particular inquest that uh, start, started to get going. you interested? What got me going was a headline in the Western Morning News of the 2nd of October, which um, I was alerted to by my dear friend Joe in Torquay, my professional gardener friend, and I got the paper and I saw this headline, um, 
and I've repeated it to you at the start of this inquiry, at the start of this interview, and the headline ran, Care Home, well, you know it anyway, or repeat it. I'm trusting my memory, actually, now, but that alerted me. And the, it was quite obvious that there was some scapegoating of this nurse and a general impression created for the public that the care of these people had not been entirely adequate in the context of COVID. Well, because this one care worker didn't believe COVID existed. No, he was resistant to wearing a mask. And I can imagine what it's like wearing a mask in theatre in operating theatre, in any stuffy environment with a, you know, a temperature of, say, 25 degrees, which is often what is needed for the care of the elderly who lose heat quickly. But wearing a mask in stuffy rooms in that environment would have been very difficult for any conscientious person. So, I had reacted to the cluster in a very conscious, conscientious way, in March and April of 2021, I wrote to the chief constable, a man called Sawyer, who I think is a decent man, who I know, know was later attacked by Miss Woodman of the Spotlight BBC in a rather aggressive manner about some misdemeanor or some inadequacy supposed in him. But I wrote to him, and it's a very full letter, and it's on the current posting on my website. It's attached, I think, the number four attachment. It's about a three-page letter, three A4s. It shows you that I was thinking, that I was, that I've been well-trained, and I've remained well-informed in my uh, job as a surgeon and in my retirement. And in that, I asked the chief constable for the autopsy findings made at the Royal Devon Exeter Hospital Exeter to be made public, obviously with anonymization. That was refused when he referred it to the FOI, officer responsible for FOI, I think a civilian actually, and there's a let, that let refusal is also on the, in that posting. So that was then, and I was obviously very unhappy with the whole way the whole thing was, was managed, and I was suspicious that those deaths had possibly been caused by vaccination of what I call toxic junk. Toxic junk. Now, when I was alerted to the fact, I wrote, that's right, I remember now, I wrote in May, because I hear there was an inquest, it would have been an inquest about these deaths in the care home. I wrote in May to the coroner's office, or coroner's office in the county hall in Exeter, saying that I wished to give evidence. Now, that was back in May. I, I've had to look after my, help my very disabled wife, Sue. We've been married for 63 years. And my focus, quite rightly, was on the Holocaust in Gaza, where I've been 10 times, and which has been grafted on to a genocide, starting with vigor and all evil in, um, 19, in 1948. Uh, I... I have friends in Gaza. I don't know whether my dear friend Mahmoud Baroud, PhD, is still alive or not. We haven't heard a WhatsApp message from him for about a month now. But this morning, I heard from Ramzi Baroud, who is the editor of the rather marvellous Palestine Chronicle. He's in America and editing it from there, but they're reporting often within minutes or hours of happenings in Gaza, yet more massacres, sometimes the last time of people praying in the so-called safe place, a remaining Umrah school. Most have been bombed flat, actually. But I've heard this morning from Ramsey that his doctor sister, I forget her first name now, but she's been killed along with six others in a taxi. And I'm going to post his words of in bereavement on my other website, The Dove and Dolphin, later on today. So, uh, look, before we get away... So you can understand me yeah. that the, an inquest on five, seven old sausages, frail old people, 
who perhaps could have been better looked after in regard to respiratory infection from COVID or in other general ways, that was very much down my list of priorities. But that headline on the 2nd of October alerted me. I thought, well, I must take part in this because I know about it. I know a great deal. I was trained well in virology and immunology, in immunology by a fellow who was later a Nobel Prize winner, a wonderful man called Professor Ken Porter. And I also know about epidemiology. I was trained well as a young medical student in all the necessary fields. Yeah, just going back to this um, uh, case here, there's a sort of, it seems to me, I mean, you're, you're talking about being conscientious. It seems yeah. there's, a, there's been a complete falling away of conscientiousness. This is even when you're contacting public officials nowadays. Yes. And moral fibre. They, uh, they ignore you that the first technique is not to reply. Well, the, first, uh, the other thing is, of course, they re- there is an anonymous reply saying something like in brackets, administrator, with yes. no name. Exactly. And uh, when I have a phone call, I say, what is your name? They say, oh, I'm Kerry. I say, what is your family name? And quite often, if it's a corporate setup like West Water, Southwest Water, another shower, they will refuse to give you their surname. Well, even even public uh, yes, servants now. I know. Nowadays. I know. Well, you're so the, there's, a, there's a, the idea is that you're an anonymous person yes. working for a faceless organisation. I agree with you, and that I see that with Timber District Council, a frankly fascist organisation, and Devon County Council. I could not speak reasonably about I think it. You have to ask them. What have you got to hide? Exactly. They got a lot to hide. At the moment, uh, Devon. County Council have used uh, money from what's it called some cities fund that Johnson set up. It's about two million. They're digging up um, Queen Street in Newton Abbott. All the traders and most of the public have opposed it. I've been down there yesterday to the bank nationwide. It is chaotic. The, uh, f- the firm are anonymous too. They don't have any name on their high vis jackets. Well, look, uh, they've let, had to redo. Listen to this. They've had to. They've set in a new. The road. The road has been narrowed so that traffic can make can have access, but it's difficult. There's much less parking for people, so they don't just, as they say, pop in. But they've had. They put this is down, a hostile environment. They put the curb to down. They've had to remove the curb because it wasn't set properly. So you're hearing the tremendous noise of concrete cutting, diamond cutting saws. Let's take a step back from COVID for a minute, because yes, I think I'm the most there. interesting, the most interesting aspect to it all is the this accelerationist side. Exactly. So the otherwise, what you've got is you've got a crisis, a, a human created crisis. You don't really need to be a genius to work out that this was most definitely leaked from a lab, whether deliberately or accidentally. COVID nineteen is a product of the research into these. Uh, bat viruses, pangolin viruses, or whatever, but also the evidence quite clearly right from the start was that this is an engineered human genetically engineered virus. Um, but the point is the the accelerationist aspect to it is the vaccine which is then presented as the solution. Yes. So you create a crisis, yes. you create a a fake solution which makes things worse. This is what's known as accelerationism the creation of chaos the creation of war is another aspect to yes. it all um so we have an, a, a a prison break by hamas in october the 7th 2023 the solution is to impose a genocide exactly the same sort of thing so you've got you've got uh, this being done another one for example is the climate so rather than limiting the use of private transport, private cars, uh, and reintroducing very cheap nationalised rail and bus uh, transport, what do you do? You, no, you, you introduce a net zero policy, which just simply increases the price of energy up to the most expensive production method, which is nuclear energy, and you impoverish the entire country. Uh, so this is a perverse philosophy it's a nietzschean philosophy uh and i'm I, what i'm interested in is ways around this really so particularly with covid david uh, i'd like to hear from you what evidence you've come up with 
and what you think is going on inside people's bodies when they have had this jab. The results seem to be, I mean, many people have heard about myocarditis, that is to say uh, heart disease, uh, other things to do with blood clotting. But how might we know if one of our loved ones, one of our friends who's had a jab is now suffering from that jab? Well, um, there's a word called protein, P-R-O-T-E-A-N. It was applied to the symptoms and signs of syphilis, I remember, when I was being educated as a medical student and later as a doctor. And the adverse effects, a euphemism, adverse effects of this experimental, unnecessary, toxic junk are protein. The Japanese government is now apologizing to their population for forcing vaccines into their muscles. They have listed 215 adverse effects of the vaccine. One of the main effects, you see, the what is it, the, the context. If you look at my website and put in COVID, you will find 52 references. Now with my piece today, uh, yesterday, about the inquests on the Helmsley Care Home, it's probably 53, I should think. But there's a lot of information on that gathered from people who are leaders in the field, people like Peter McCulloch in America, who's been take his license has been taken away, from other people there, uh, from Rhino Fulmick, a lawyer who, adv- who has advocacy rights both in Germany and in um, America, who's been in prison for four months in Germany for speaking the truth, from Uti Kruger, MD, German qualified, but working in Sweden. She has a 20-minute video that she made. She's obviously a wonderful pathologist, and she's brave. She's also been ostracized and got at in Sweden for speaking the truth about COVID. So now the first thing that it does, uh, let's go back a bit. Um, Professor Pollard, Anthony Pollard, he hasn't got actually any deep qualification if you look at him, but he is the chairman or leader of the so-called um, Oxford Group for Vaccine Research. It was they who, with funding from AstraZeneca, a major pharmacy company, allied in fact to others as well, like Smith Klein French, no doubt, uh, they decided to produce the AstraZeneca vaccine, which you will recall was re- withdrawn uh, in the middle of 2021 because of um, adverse reactions, terrible actually, including sagittal sinus thrombosis in young people, which I've never seen in life, and I know a lot about pathology. So what is that? What? It's a clot. There's a, a, vena, a sinus. A sinus is a cavity. But in the top of your top of your brain, inside the skull, there's a uh, a cavity which runs from front to back called the sagittal i e it's in the it's in the line of the arrow that's where the word sagittal comes from and that they've seen death strokes from thrombosis of the veins the ve- the blood flows slowly through this sinus but because of this this is what i'm coming to the spike protein this is the protein which forms the outer coat of the coronaviridae family of viruses, called corona because corona is like this, it's a fuzz, it's sort of a ray around the central body of the virus, hence the name corona, first identified as a family of viruses in the 1960s. Possibly it's the Mary's, I don't know. That, the immunization which Pollard visualized in a light bulb moment in a taxi, probably with the paramount psychopath Neil Ferguson from Imperial, uh, that, uh, that his, what he perceived uh, would, uh, could be produced causes the human body, in fact the, the animal body, to react to the vaccine by producing spike protein. That spike protein damages the wonderfully slippery intima, that's the inside membrane of the vessels. As a surgeon, I can tell you, if a blood... Um, if a 
blood vessel is opened, an artery or a vein, with your gloved hand, and you put your hand on in, on this inside membrane, it's beautifully slippery. This allows the blood to flow cleanly and healthily along the vessel. The spike protein damages the intima, so you get blood platelets, which are essential for the process of clotting. They they um, clot, they they cluster around the damage. Then the clotting cascade, which is complex, involves several factors, in fact, up to factor 10, actually. The clotting happens, and the clot forms. So, embalmers in America, uh, O'Looney in Milton Keynes, and other people have described remarkable clots in the veins of dead people. They are rubbery and white, and they can be brought out like a long snake. And I have two people currently, my dear friend Alan Horton down in Camborne. He has a snake in his right saphenous vein when he was very ill in February, having had two vaccinations against so-called covid or two so-called vaccinations against, in inverted commas, COVID, about two years ago. My son, Andrew, who's normally a very fit fellow, had a pulmonary a clot go to his lung, in about six months ago. And I'm fairly certain what happened was this. He had one jab, because he wanted to go abroad for holiday with his wife and grandchildren, or his children, and he probably had exposure to COVID, to one of the mu- one of the variants which have resulted from mutation of the original Wuhan virus, and in response to that mild infection, which you probably hardly noticed, there was then a surge of spike protein. He ended up with pleurisy. Scanning showed a pulmonary and a little later he had pain in his calf, and a DVT was diagnosed. I think he probably had an embolus from a major vessel and the calf came secondary. Do you understand me? So Andrew was near death. He didn't, he didn't, he's a very, uh, we brought up both our children, Andrew and Fiona, to be tough, well, not to be tough, but to get on with things, and they did. Our dear daughter Fiona died in May of last year, May the 5th, of a turbo cancer, which is another result of this most evil vaccination part of your accelerationism. So, so Fiona, Fiona had first symptoms in she had two AstraZeneca injections because she was considering going back to being a carer supervisor, which she'd done for nine years previously, and then wanted to break from that. Quite a very, very, she was very conscientious too, but she was not the fittest. She was very overweight, but she was very good at her job. She cared about people because she'd been brought up by a, a mum who was a nurse and a doc, and a dad who was a doctor and surgeon. So they knew what mattered in um, the care of human beings and of animals, actually, and of all creatures. Okay, but, you've just mentioned cancer there. Yes. Is, that, is, is this potentially a cause it's, by it's, the... the it's, it's being caused, it's causing the death prematurely of thousands upon thousands of people. And I could recite ones even in this parish. We have Chris Busby. He's also in Devon, actually, North Devon and Biddeford and also yeah. in Latvia. He puts a lot of the cancers down to radiation in the environment. No. Um, and uh, so, well, I mean, they're talking about the increase in the last 50, 60, 70 years in cancer to the environment. But uh, what you seem to be saying is that this is another potential cause yeah. for cancer going on here. Um, so is there anything other than causing blood clots, which obviously in different parts of the body have a different, you know, instant death or a very slow effect, and the carcinogenic aspect to it, um, are there any other effects that you think that these toxic jabs yeah, have been the, having? The, the cancer effects are the turbo cancers. I understand that one, that one string of genes in the, that they insert into the vaccine uh, can, are oncogenic, they are tumorigenic. This was found er, quite early on, actually. So that's one factor. Well, I'm not sure that, what the spike protein does to cells, but it may also st- simulate mutation. I agree with Busby. Uh, a lot, the, the 
inclining the the incidence of cancers uh, in almost all nations, actually, particularly the Western so-called civilized nations, is increasing. And that is a lot to do with the fact that there were 1,200 nuclear tests in the 50s and 60s. The biggest bang, I think, was on Christmas Island. And I've written about that. I know a great deal about that and how they had 25,000 guinea pigs on Christmas Island. A fellow called Sir William Penny was in charge of these tests. They wanted a big bang, our politicians, and they got it, actually. But Sir William Penny flew off in um, the plane the day before the big bang on Hiroshima. That shows you the people we're dealing with. And um, so, so we've got a increasing level of mutation leading to cancers, particularly in people whose immunity is lowered by poor nutrition, by increasing age. Then we have the accelerationist dream of creating a problem with a virus engineered with American dollars in Wuhan, two tranches from the Center for Disease, Disease Control run by Mr. Anthony Fauci for 28 years, uh, funded by the Americans, released in the wet market in Wuhan sometime and announced on the 12th of December. And then we have about something like 5 billion people injected with toxic junk in a most remarkable psychological operation, which, of course, uh, goes back to the accelerationists. I think if people are um, concerned that the doctors aren't taking them... I mean, this story you were telling earlier about the... Uh, um, the, the doctor in A and E uh, putting a uh, tube down somebody yes. into somebody's stomach, where actually the problem was in their lungs. Yes. I mean, this sounds like gross incompetence, idiocy. Uh, if people are looking for any sort of proper diagnosis around nowadays, it, you know, if you're not getting that from your GP, where can you go? Well, in fact, Tony, I've come to the conclusion that some of the so-called care, is deliberately negligent. They're doing things to people. They're telling people, I could, tell, I could recite dozens of cases where people have been to a doctor, a GP most often, and they're given advice, inverted commas, advice, which is obviously contrary to all logic. There's an old chap that Joe Gardens for. He had a ulcer, a lesion on his scalp, he was uh, sent by the GP to a dermatologist in Torquay who reassured him there was nothing to worry about. He said, two operations since, delayed by about four or five months, I think latterly by, uh, last by a plastic surgeon, perhaps in Exeter, I don't know the details, but he now has been told he's got, this has healed where the original lesion was, but he's now got bobbles all around his face and neck apparently, and a nurse has told him that's not to do with cancer. But the last advice from the hospital was that if he needed a third operation, it would be a neurosurgeon. That indicates to me that the skull is involved with this tumor. Now, he was reassured that there was nothing to be done when he first presented. So you wonder, you know, a policeman, you know, a road cleaner, if he saw his scalp originally, might have said, this looks serious. Do you understand me? So I see what appears to be deliberate, not neg negligence is the wrong word, actually. It seems to be deliberate, malcare, we'll call it. Right. Well, also, this uh, whole thing of social care um, has been a running sore, really, ever since the big cutbacks to local authority yes. budgets by George Osborne and the Tories in 2011. So... Massive problems in the care system. So first of all, um, the local authority care homes are closed and everyone's supposed to go private. But then the funding for that has been cut. Yes. So you have this awful problem of bed blockers. So yes. there are people in hospital who've been treated on the road to recovery, but no place can be found in care or maybe even at home with complex care needs. Um, the local authorities are just simply 
um, refusing to reply to requests from hospitals because they don't have the money to care for people. Uh, the temptation then, of course, within the hospital is just to put somebody like this on a something like the Liverpool Care Pathway yes. to say, well, look, we, we need this bed and you're in the way. Well, I can't comment on, on individual reactions, but uh, obviously we have pressure. But if you, on my same website, put in community hospitals, you'll find that Halpin has fought for the life of community hospitals for last something like 15 years. There's 51 references to that. And there's some very, very important papers amongst them. I've been to North Devon five times, spoken on one occasion on a podium with others to about 5,000 people by the, by the uh, Tamar and pleading to keep the hospitals in North Devon. They've closed 70% of the beds in community hospitals in Devon, including our local one in Ashburton, where there were 10 beds. They reduced them to eight because they were concerned about bed space. But they, they looked after, but the GPs didn't want to go on doing it, and that's the key factor. But I think that they will be they will, will, will be reopened. They have to be because the hospitals cannot cope. Well, what I'm saying, I though, hang on. my ward around. I say this lady is able to go. She's able to go now to a uh, to the cottage hospital sister. She's fit. She's fit to do that. The physio agrees. They've tried her out on steps, and they know that she can progress. And the sister used to phone up at the end of the round, phone up Morton Hampstead or. Tynmouth or Dartmouth, all closed, and say, can you take Mrs. So-and-so? She's local to you, and her GP is Dr. So-and-so. And the answer almost was, yes, we can. The patient would have gone in the next 48 hours by ambulance, and she'd have gone to people who knew her in the locality. And the, and the cook there, as in Ashburton, would go around in the evening and say, what would you like for supper, dearie? So a person who was frail, with a frail appetite, would have a little meal that she needed because nourishment and sleep is vital in a recovery from surgery or acute illness. We're dealing with fascism, Tony. And fascism, my definition, is a subhuman who delights in crushing the life out of humans, as in Gaza, under concrete. Well, what about this um, treatment that people are given, at so-called end-of-life treatment? Actually, what may happen is they may have another 10 years ahead of them, but they're sitting in a hospital, uh, no beds can be found for them, or no care can be found for them if they go home, but they do need continued care, maybe for another few months. Uh, and so some some treatment is given to those individuals which is designed to almost shut them down. Well, Tony, I will be honest. On my ward rounds, I had to, I did, I believe, consider each patient individually. I remember that when I first went to Torbay, there was a high incidence of bed sores in the female ward. That's a terrible complication. Uh, it's very painful. It can lead to septicemia in some, but it's a, they take months to heal, and they should never happen. Uh, Sue would have been taught as in her nursing training at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital how patients, how they always prevented bed sores. They were a terrible complication. So on my ward rounds, uh, when there were less able old ladies, I used to, in my white coat, after, wash my hands after each patient, I would turn them myself onto their side so I examined their sacrum to make damn sure they didn't have a bed sore so they knew that Halpin was looking at that for, in particular now some of those old ladies had come from care homes they were very frail they, they, they had any one one way path and that was to go back to the care home they were giving up they were faced to the wall as we could say when people lose the will to live they don't live and I would occasionally say to sister sister I think this patient needs some morphine. Now, I know that nurses, by nature, never like to let patients go. And I'd, sometimes, I remember this, I'd come around the next morning, I'd say, how is Mrs. So-and-so? Or Miss So-and-so? Just to say, well, she's rather better. I found that morphine sometimes helped these old ladies recover. So, and I'm being honest about that. But what I'm saying there is that lingering death when people see no hope in their lives 
even though people have tried perhaps to help them recover that, that sometimes they need to be helped from our life with morphine. The God of Sleep, that's what it's named after. Now, I, that was my attitude. But the nurse's staff, some of them, of course, would uh, in fact take a very energetic opposite view that everyone should try, should be kept alive. But we were taught as medical students, this is a very important message, actually. These, were, these linguistics are important. Do not strive officiously, officiously, to keep alive. And I believe that, actually. Um, we had dear Mary, who we lost last May, from a turbo cancer caused by AstraZeneca times two, which was mandated by Mr. Johnson et al., for people returning in the care field. Um, her second husband, uh, Mike, ex-Navy, a chain smoker, ended up with uh, the, most, the most aggressive cancer that the surgeon who cared for him in Yeovil uh, had ever seen. He'd seen about 500. Uh, smoking, sm cigarettes contain about 250 chemicals, 230 chemicals, some of which are tumorigenic. Mike had smoked from the age of 17 in the Royal Navy, where they were encouraged to smoke in the mess room. You'll remember there was a cigarette called Navy Cut, and Senior Service, another one. Uh, so he smoked for the next 45 years. He was in the intelligence division of the Royal, Nash of the Royal Navy and at one time worked at Morwenstow uh, where they were, in fact, following Russian submarines down the North Sea. But Mike came out of the Navy. He lost his pension when he put it in the hands of a naval officer who was running a pension scheme, so he wasn't full of, very well off for money. But he married Fiona, and they were a lovely couple. They were, he was great with children. But he got this cancer, and the surgeon in Yeovil, who I think was a very good man actually, referred him to the tertiary unit in Southmead. There he was treated by a very um, skillful surgeon of Greek name, but he was treated, over-treated terribly. He was there for six weeks, and they operated on him, I think, three times. And my son Andrew and his wife Fiona uh, and my and, and dear Sue went to visit him when he was dying in the intensive care ward. The treatment there probably cost the NHS about a hundred thousand pound, and Mike was effectively tortured by being kept officiously to keep alive. If if rational medicine and rational doctors had cared for him, he would have stayed in Sherborne. If he if it became difficult for Fee to nurse him at home, he would have been admitted to the local community hospital, excellent Eastman, Eastman Hospital, and Fiona could have held his hand as he died in peace. Instead, he was tortured to death by a bloody system which is mechanistic. And it's like that it's so often. I hear of it so often. It's, it, it really is. It, I have to speak so strongly. We've lost our... We've lost our spirit, Tony. Yeah. Uh, so, soul. It, it was soulless. It was, it, Look, was, it was. We were taught um, comfort always, cure sometimes. Uh, it's a French adage. It's a very important one, actually. But in other words, if you put yourself in the shoes of the patient, or you say, or we used to say another little thing we were taught as students and which I use very much as a doctor, you say, what would you do if it was your mother? That was a very important question. Well, look, a lot of this uh, dis decision about uh, death is now, well, it's enormous financial implications, particularly for pension funds who don't particularly want to pay out for someone yes. who's going to live for 20 years. Yes. It would be yes. quite costly if they can end that pension payment. That's rather handy for them uh, f from a financial point of view. Um, but we've now got these in, uh, people like Esther Ranson also trying to almost encourage people to go to a doctor uh, and say, please, I've had enough. Can you please end my life? Now, what do you make of the move towards assisted dying? Um, it's all part of the um, – it's part of this – I can see your word accelerationist is good to apply to this. It's a plan to make people feel that they are superfluous in this world. Uh, 
particularly if they're getting older. And a good example is one in this parish. She was very obedient. She was the secretary of the local WI, not necessarily an organization not necessarily known for deep thought. She was a, a spinster, been a librarian, very fit at the age of 74, I think, or 76. She, of course, had the vaccine. She had an ovarian tumor, malignant, which followed that. The Japanese found that the spike protein or the, the vaccine concentrated, especially in the female ovaries in the female. She had the diagnosis made. She had chemotherapy at Torbay Hospital. I'm sure they didn't tell us any relationship to the vaccine. But Val, who I would say as a doctor, and I'm good at these things, sort of things, could have lived to 95 or 100, was quite happy to die of her ovarian cancer. Even though she was leading a full life, she's now moved from this par parish down to a flat in, she's quite well off actually, down to a flat in Timbeth, where she's surviving, I think, quite well actually. But at that point, I spoke to her at length on the phone, said, don't have any more, don't have any more boosters, Val. It's quite likely there was a relationship to the vaccine, but she was um, nonchalant about it. And I've spoken with Joe particularly of a condition of the mind which we saw, which we were taught, and it happens, in multiple sclerosis. People with MS, as they call it, and it's become also more frequent, often show what the French call la belle indifference. They show a um, lack of deep concern about their condition, even though they may be grossly disabled. And they're showing the same in response to the vaccination. And, in fact, it's been reported, there's no question about it, that the spike protein enters the brain. And some people believe, they reckon that, I think in South Korea it's been reported and elsewhere, they've seen an, in, an increase in sort of psychosis and of other disturbances of the mind. And if you, if you look at my website and put in Hopkins, H-O-P-K-I-N-S, my dear Tarfoto friend, a man of sort of, shall we say, simple urges, but very skilled in his field of tires, very important for people driving vehicles at speed, you will find that he was very ill within about eight hours of having AstraZeneca jab, so he could go and visit his dear old dad in the care home in Timbeth, that being a necessary way of getting to see your relative, another of the accelerationist plans. He was bloody ill. And he had a very intense headache, and you can guarantee that that um, vaccine was circulating in his cerebrum because the blood-brain barrier is another myth promoted by doctors. And we know that it's gone into the brains, and I see this, Tony. I've noticed a particular gait, and it's so common. I see it in dear Sue, who had one jab. I see it in her brother, Neil, who visited recently. But you see people walking, <coughs> little uncertainly, they lift up their knees in a rot. They don't have what I call a swing-through gait. Normally, we have a heel-toe gait. We swing our the foot. One leg goes forward. The heel strikes. It's called heel strike. And then as the weight is taken on that leg, you then take the weight on the sole of your foot as you go to the next step. This is, um, this is normal. Any physio will tell you this. Anyone who's studied gait, any person who's running a gym will tell you that. These people don't walk like that. And yesterday in Newton Abbott, when I was going to the bank, I saw dozens like it. And some, in fact, had a more marked uh, variation of that. Their feet were flopping as well. And as students, we were taught this. You knew when the Lord of How when the House of Lords was finishing a session as they were coming out into the street, you could hear their feet sapping because they had a tabetic, T-A-B-E-T-I-C, a tabetic gait that comes from tabes dorsalis, the condition of the spinal cord caused by tertiary syphilis. And what is happening, I think, is that the, 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 the vaccine, potentially the spike protein, has affected the cerebellum, the hindbrain of these people, or possibly their spinal cord. Have you got the message? The We're talking about, apart from 
the Holocaust and the genocide, and the previous Holocaust, like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we're talking about a massive global crime. And I'm hoping before I die, and I'm not going to die soon, I can tell you, I don't think, although my prostate's under question at the moment, uh, I hope to see these people brought to Nuremberg too. I hope that will happen. And Mr. Blair will be there in line with people like, um, well, Kissinger's dead, of course, but Mr. Bush will be there and Mr. and um, our friend uh, ben Benjamin Netanyahu and Gallant and other people in the Israeli high command. Well, you mentioning the, the Lords, um, I have to ask you about the Queen. It's just been announced that she uh, had, well, by Boris Johnson, I'm not sure if it's true, it'd be interesting to hear from you what, what you think. She had bone cancer, and that was what she died of. She probably had a condition called myeloma, and uh, she that same condition uh, was suffered, I believe, in a divorcee lady of a GP, a GP I knew well in Newton Abbott, I won't tell her name, but she died about 200 yards from here, and she called me in desperation one evening because the pain in her spine was not being uh, controlled by drugs, more or the moderate analgesics, by prescribed on the phone, on the phone, by the general practice locally. She had been seen initially by a locum, well, no, by an older doctor in the practice who told her the pain was, inverted commas, muscular, a very common, useless and diagnosis that you keep hearing. I went to see this lady. She'd lost two stone in weight. She'd had blood in her stool, fresh blood, which is not necessarily significant, about two months before. She was a highly intelligent woman, a bit tricky to deal with. And she couldn't move in her chair without feeling sudden pain in her spine. I thought it highly likely that she had a thing called myeloma, which is a plasma cell tumor affecting the bone marrow. I looked after a lady from Hungary called Bialis when I was registrar in 1971 at the orthopedic hospital in uh, Princess Elizabeth in Exeter, which the fascists bulldozed in 1996. So orthopedic surgery would become less available to the generality. Well, that sounds like it's nothing to do with the jab then, because my immediate no. suspicion, um, well, to see both the Duke of Edinburgh and Queen Elizabeth die very soon after they had, roughly a year after they had their, their um, COVID jabs. It is leukemias and tumours of the blood cells, which include plasma cells, are being reported in greater number following the jabbing of toxic junk. Put in toxic junk on Halpin's website. Okay, finally, we, we must finish by looking at the situation in Gaza, Lebanon, and with this particular far-right block running Israel now, absolute racists being constantly supplied with money and arms by the United States, an attempt really to disrupt all the countries around this incredible ability that the uh, news media have to repeat the lies about the Israelis being the victims yes, exactly. somehow yeah. uh, of all of this, even though they are invading, bombing, assassinating in Gaza, uh, Lebanon, they're now attacking countries like Iran, Syria, Syria cre assassinating people in these countries. Uh, the BBC used the term audacious to uh, uh, describe assassinations in foreign countries. I would call it utterly reckless. We know back in 1914 it was the assassination of Arch Archduke Franz Ferdinand uh, in Sarajevo that began the whole process of a probably already prepared First World War, which was between the three cousins, wasn't it? Yeah. The cousins' war uh, between Tsar, Tsar Nicholas, Kaiser Wilhelm, <laughs> and uh, our very own uh, King George. <laughs> so what do you make of Netanyahu and this government? Because we're now seeing him doing these raw, raw – I mean, maybe a mental nurse, a mental health doctor might be able to uh, explain what's going on in this man's head because – 
uh, he's been doing broadcasts where he's addressing the people of Lebanon, he's addressing the people of Iran, these countries which he's attacking, and saying, it's okay, I'm coming to relieve you of your evil government, I will kill them off. Uh, and he thinks that the populations of those countries are going to be happy about it. It's almost like uh, a broadcast by Adolf Hitler uh, in 1940 or 41 to the British people saying it's okay uh, we're going to get rid of Winston Churchill and we will relieve the British population of their evil government well um, again on our website if you put in part P-A-R-T you'll find that there are 12 articles which uh, the essence of which is the continuum of fascism America has been a fascist country at least since World War II. This country has been a fascist country, I'd say, for about uh, at least two centuries. And I cite the Tolpuddle Martyrs as being obvious, uh, the definition is obvious in, reply, in, in applying to them, the subhuman who delights in crushing the life out of humans. At that time, in 1842 and before, a few farm workers got together uh, quietly and secretly and then were spied on and eventually were treated in the most terrible ways by the church, by the law and by the state under uh, Lord Melbourne for wishing to maintain a, a, a wage of seven shillings as opposed to six which they were reducing it to when their children were starving. So that was an example of how things were then to over 200 years ago and nothing has changed, Tony. And the preface of my articles has this. This is a very, very important message. And I mustn't f forget to give you a link to a film which shows the genocide in Palestine continuing in 2003 when I took a ship there with some supplies. The preface is this. Hiroshima, May the 5th, 1945, the London Agreement, which involved the U.S., the USSR, as it then was, the U.K. and France, they sat down in London in, on the 8th of May, 2045, to decide how to run the Nuremberg trial of Nazi war criminals. On the 9th of May, 1945, they killed another 100,000 people thereabouts in Nagasaki. The facts of it were, as you know, concealed for years by the Americans, but one very brave Australian reporter was there on the ground and he reported most of what was happening. The story, as you know, is horrific, particularly for those who survived and died of tumours later, and there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. But that shows you how the nations then had US, USSR, France and UK, at least those nations and others as well, had fascism woven into them. And we know that damn well from who was resisting, who was with the Nazis before World War II in this country. Think of Mosley. Think of uh, Prince Edward. Prince Edward, is it? Was that his name? The fellow who married uh, Miss Simpson. Was that right? Well, he was, yeah, uh, he Edward, the, up, Edward VIII. He met up Edward VIII. The king for what? A few weeks, wasn't he? Before he abdicated. But he was a friend of the Nazis, wasn't he? Wasn't he? We've had these people infesting our country because most people don't want that. Most people want to be, the icon is Mother Madonna, the mother with a baby on her breast in security and peace without having to worry about bombs falling on them or being starved or having to flee as four million did from Iraq. This is the thing. Look at eyes open Gaza, YouTube. Just put in that, that those words. Eyes open Gaza, YouTube. A 20-minute film of the voyage of the Dove and the Dolphin, starting from Torquay on the 1st of February, 2003, and finishing in Gaza on the 17th of February. 
we heard on the 16th the massive march on the ship's radio uh, in London opposing the Iraq war, which had zero influence on the fascists running our country then. Well, that's right, Mr Blair has now been promoted to the uh, Order of the Garter. So yes. he's w waffling around, yes. uh, uh, wafting about w with his various medals and uh, yes. in, uh, in, in the uh, courtyard of Windsor Palace with all this. Uh, I mean, I, I, I look at these orders of chivalry and knighthood and say, well, literally, the people who are the most evil in the country are recruited into them. Yeah. Well, I said often, if I was running the show, I'd abolish the um, honours list immediately because it's uh, someone wanted to promote me to, um, I don't know, MB or something in North Devon. She wasn't that, that very stable lady. But I wrote back saying if I was offered it, I would, which is highly unlikely, I'd refuse it straight away because i think that it's grossly tainted the whole system stinks it's like john lennon what john, like john lennon yes did he do that did he no it stinks it stink it, it's it, it's beyond belief I think he said we're run by psychopaths we are run by psychopaths anyway, david would you like to just remind listeners of your website again yes my website is like two websites one's dove and dolphin dot gov uk i think i can't remember now uh, the other one is D Halpin, D H A L P I N dot I N F O A C 